Welcome, everybody, to today's Building My Legacy podcast. I have with me today Aurora Winter. You are going to absolutely fall in love with her just as I have. She comes out of Silicon Valley and out of Hollywood, and she writes, and she has this ability to take this IT part of her, the neuroscience of her, the creative part of her, the wordsmithing part of her, and put things together into wonderful ways. She is a leader who has published. Um, She helps people with public speaking. She does the storytelling so you can get your marketing done and actually sell effectively. She has been on ABC, uh, CBS, TV, KTLA TV. She has been in Success Magazine, Elle Magazine, Oprah Radio. Her latest books, Thought Leader Launch and Turn Your Words into Wealth are two remarkable books that I think you will both, uh, you will want to, to get both of them and to read. So with that, Aurora, I want you to share with the audience how you have this dual personality and how you got into doing what you're doing. Oh, thanks, Lois, for that great introduction. I'm so looking forward to helping your audience create a meaningful legacy. And of course, I love to help people do that through stories. So my background's in film and television. I love writing. I was head of development for Canada's largest film and television production company, which was called Atlantis Films at the time. And so I love helping people with 250 hours of television production, getting the stories right, getting the story arcs right. And then I also have this other side of me that's an entrepreneur and I, uh, living in Silicon Valley, helped people go from nobody could understand what the heck they were talking about to raising millions of dollars and launching their startups. So I have that, uh, that affinity for the Hollywood storytelling and also have a soft spot in my heart for those eggheads and analytical people who have great ideas, but somehow, sometimes they need a little help communicating their ideas to the rest of the world. Yeah. You know, what I find, Aurora, is that when it's your idea, it is very hard to tell that story. And so having somebody who can really get it and tell the story for you in an effective way, that is a tremendous asset. So how is it? How do you get into people's heads so you pull this out of them and just make it come to life? Oh, yeah. Well, I really love people. And I'm very curious. I mean, before we started uh, the recording the podcast, I was asking you, peppering you with questions and found out that you're actually, uh, you've got three books in mind that you're going to write. And I was genuinely curious. And I find the quality of the speaking is related to the quality of the listening. So as it's natural for me, because I'm very curious, and I love people, and I love their ideas, and I want to know more, as I am asking people, tell me more, tell me more, more comes out. And so that is a, a, a way that I help the clients that I'm helping them write their books or discover exactly what is it that's so cool about their business ideas so that they can pitch it and raise capital or so that they can turn it into a TED talk or another kind of a presentation. So I think that open curiosity and really caring is uh, a key part of that. And then what I really want people to know is there's never been a better time to become an author. There's never been a better time to become a thought leader and to make a difference and leave a legacy because there's no more gatekeepers. I mean, it used to be so hard to get a book published. It used to be so hard to get a movie made because you had to go through layer after layer after layer of gatekeepers. And, you know, you'd get have to get an agent and then the agent would have to pitch your book and then you'd have to get the publisher and then they'd have to go through the editor and then da, 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 da. And then if you wanted a movie made, well, it was maybe, you know, 10 years later before that might even happen. But now, I mean, you can make a documentary yourself. You just, I mean, you can use your iPhone nowadays. They're practically that good. Um, on a very low budget, you can you can make a decent documentary. You can self-publish today, and there's so many tools available. Uh, obviously, Amazon, but other places too. Apple, Kobo. There's all kinds of places to publish your book. And because of Zoom and other things like this that you and I are communicating on Zoom, I got a chance to really get to know you. But there's ways to connect with editors, with ghostwriters, with 
marketing people who will help you with every stage of, of the journey. So now, bottom line, everyday ordinary people like me and <laughs> like you, well, you're not that ordinary, but you know, everyday people have access to the same tools that politicians and celebrities have been using for decades. Do you really think that politicians and celebrities write every word of their book and proof it and get it laid out and design the cover? No, and they haven't done that forever. They've had a team of people like myself, journalists who interview them and then editors who edit it and people who lay it out. But now everybody has access to these tools at affordable rates. So there's never been a better time to turn your words into wealth. And um, that's what I love to, to share with people. So Aurora, if you're going to help somebody write their book, tell mm -hmm. their story, what's your process? What can people anticipate? Well, I have two different ways that I help people. One is uh, uh, weekly coaching and, and text messaging and then, you know, videos. I call it the sister-in-law plan because I helped my sister-in-law launch her children's book and it's won four awards now. It's called wow. Where's My Joey? It's an adorable uh, a book to read to your children and enjoy about a baby kangaroo. Um, so there's that plan for the people on a budget. Most of my clients are running seven, eight, nine figure businesses. So they want more of a done for you plan. So how I do that, I call it the spoken author process. And I first interview them multiple times to understand their business, understand their goals, see what is it exactly that they would like to achieve. Then once I understand what would be a tipping point for their business, then I suggest a kind of a book. And once they approve that kind of book, then I interview them. So how um, an example of a tipping point, like before going into the book, I use my Silicon Valley part or my MBA part or the part of me that's launched several successful businesses to see where is the tipping point. So I had some clients who were dentists in San Diego and they were fabulous dentists, but they were attracting clients like every other dentist, you know, free exam or hundred dollar exam. But when I understood their business more deeply, you know, somebody who just everyday person might be uh, several hundred dollars that they spend on their teeth, but somebody over 40 might come in and spend 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. So it would make more sense for them to attract people over 40. So for those clients, I suggested, why don't we write a book called Keys to a Healthy Smile After 40? Seven Secrets to Feeling Seven Years Younger. And so it's a very practical book that they can give to people who visit their office. They've been on the media with it. They got greeted as celebrities, but their bottom line changed from about one and a half million to six million. Because if your average transaction goes from $400 to $10,000, obviously that's gonna have a big impact on the bottom line. So that's the first step is uh, figuring out what would be most valuable to that person. And then, um, and then I do kind of like what we're doing. Once we've got the outline for the book, then I do podcast like interviews. And in one hour of interview, we get about 8,000 words. So and sometimes I interview my clients for, you know, for more than an hour, but just to keep that, even if we only do one interview a week, that's 8,000 words in a week. Most full-time writers don't even write 8,000 words in a day. So it's great progress. And then we very quickly get a messy first draft from the transcription. And then uh, we polish that, that goes through several drafts. And depending on how fancy we're getting with the, um, the structure, we braid the plot lines together and working on one nonfiction book, but I'm writing it like a legal thriller. So it's using all the structure of a TV movie. This is maybe too much details. Let me get to the point. Um, and so in several months, the, the person who's not a writer, who doesn't want to become a writer, who has no interest in being a writer, can have, can have the first draft of their book. And then, of course, we go through a whole process of, um, of promoting it, applying for awards, making sure that they're media ready, so that really it's not about just having a book, it's about creating your legacy and launching to the next level as a thought leader. So that's what I love to do. I, I, I love to help people avoid all of the mistakes I made <laughs> and all the rookie mistakes that first time authors typically make and instead leverage the technology that's available and the systems that I've created so that they have all the fun and very little of the annoying parts 
of writing a book. It's still a little bit of annoying because you do have to kind of check it and make sure that you, you've said what you wanted to say, but that doesn't have to be annoying. So it's really fun and fast. It's fun, it's fast. And the other thing, sorry, I'm so excited. But the other thing that's so good about it is the normal process of writing a book with a journalist, which I've done several times, is normally the journalist interviews the, the expert or the leader or the politician or the celebrity gets their story and then um, creates the book. And then the book is proofread and edited and, you know, polished and laid out. And then two years later, you have a book, two and a half years later, you publish a book. And then the author starts the media tour and the media training. So it, it's the normal process takes forever. You know, it takes two and a half years to get one book. Whereas really people need maybe one book and hundreds of pieces of social media content. So the way that we do it, um, the, the spoken author method, method that we do at Same Page Publishing is as I'm interviewing them, they get audio, they get video, and we can slice and dice that into, you know, one minute, you know, video clip on Instagram, you know, five minutes on on LinkedIn, I'm hearing you suggest, on, on YouTube. And of course, they can get the audio, the video, and the text. So the person, when their book is about to come out three months before that time, we start dripping out all of this content. And that creates buzz. And then it's easier for them to get on great podcasts like this one or radio or TV. So I've really you know, all the things that were problems for me in the past or that had been problems, you know, five years ago, taking advantage of the technology and turned it into a system that maximizes fun and maximizes the, the output. So it's, it's fun every step of the way. And you also get something of value every step of the way. So I just want to be clear for the audience, because we're going to have people who are going to want to write a book, right? We hope, we hope they'll want to write a book because that's a great way to become a leader, a thought leader, and to yes. also market yourself. So if you want to write a blog, what I'm hearing is we people can come to you, Aurora, contract with you to help them write the book. You will help them tell their story in a series of segments done over Zoom, which will be recorded. And then you take that and help them put that into words that are interesting for other people to read. Is that correct? That's right. So we take the Zoom recording and I transcribe it using a program called Descript. So that's done with AI. And then depending on which way they'd like to go, either we give that to a writer or sometimes I will take it on for the higher level clients or the sometimes the, the person who's doing it wants to do the second draft. So we have the messy first draft from the podcast, then somebody gets the second draft, either myself, a writer, or the client, and then we switch around who gets the third draft. We do about five drafts, five passes. So quite quickly, you get um, you get your, your manuscript. Exactly right. And sorry, I just want to say, uh, not everybody will want to work with me, and I want to give value. So in my book, my new book, Turn Words Into Wealth, I break this down and tell you all the steps. So if you want to do it by yourself and you're on a budget, you know, you can get the ebook for next to nothing. Sometimes it is nothing on sale. And so, you know, people can, can do this themselves if they would like. Okay, perfect. So once you've gotten all of that transcribed, you've gone through the five iterations, you've got an agreement, then you self-publish the book. Correct? Correct. My marketing plan. I have a publishing company called Same Page Publishing. So I self-publish my own books, but my clients may self-publish if they wish, or if they prefer, they can publish under Same Page Publishing so that they can honestly say it's with a boutique publisher, but they retain copyright and the royalties, et cetera. So that's a, maybe a, a very small point. Got it. And then you do the whole marketing piece. And, and the reason I'm going through this is the three books that I wrote earlier on, they were with a major publishing house, big publishing company out of New York, mm -hmm. no marketing. See, this is the thing. Most people think, oh, I just want to get an agent and I just want to get a publisher because they assume that that will mean the marketing's done. But what it generally means is that you've given away 90% of the profits. So you can't afford to do the marketing anymore. And 
you know, unless you're one of the authors that they've given a six or seven figure advance to, you're very unlikely to get very much marketing. You're likely to get lost in the, in the, in the thick of it. So what I like to do is make it all transparent. The client is in control. There's so many different ways to get your book out nowadays, uh, but you can do Amazon ads. You can do Facebook ads. You can use a podcast such as you have, like you're in a perfect position. I'm sure people will want to buy your book about collaboration and your other two books that you mentioned to me. I mean, just you just mentioned you've got a book, people will be like, oh, well, I want to read Lois's book. Of course, I want to know more about that. So I think there's a sea change in reality that hasn't caught up with what people think, especially people our age, because, you know, 20 years ago, what was self-publishing? Who did self-publishing? <laughs> I mean, actually, a lot of books were self-published that are uh, quite cool. Um, but most people don't don't really realize that. But the stigma around self-publishing is not accurate. More indie published books and self-published books are making money. Um, I think that, sorry, not put it exactly that way. The, the, um, the growth in book sales indicates that independently published books are now the bulk of the market on Amazon. So it's not like the big publishers and then everybody else. It's more like everybody else and then the big publishers. So I think that's really important for people to understand. You've got a you've got a process, a system that really it goes from the beginning, goes to the end, and you'll literally hold their hand through it and get the job done. Exactly. And the end is not that the book is published in my heart and mind. The end is that the book is published and received and marketed. Like my book came out last week, the, my latest book, Turn Words Into Wealth. And already it's got more than 5,000 readers. It's already won three book awards. And it's because, and I'm on this podcast one week later, but those things were set up months in advance. Like you need to months in advance consider getting on podcasts, how you're going to apply for awards, et cetera, et cetera. So I like to, uh, not, I like to take people across what I perceive as the finish line, not what they might initially think is the finish line, because there's nothing more heart wrenching than putting all that energy into writing a book, and then nobody gets to read it or hear about it because nobody did any marketing. Or I think that's tragic anyway. Yes. Probably you have something to say about that from personal experience. It's pretty sad, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's painful. And because it's a tremendous amount of work, especially if you've written every word yourself and then there's no marketing, it is very painful. And usually I'd, I'd be curious, um, maybe uh, maybe we should schedule another call and check your contracts, but typically with big publishers, it's for the life of, um, it's for the, the whole life, like it's for 75 years that so usually you've given away all rights. Sometimes there's a reversion clause, but if you give your book away to a publisher be sure to read the contract and do your best to negotiate it because you don't want to give your story away for 75 years. If they do nothing, it'd be nice to have a reversion clause, but these things are more advanced. You know, not everybody thinks of these things. So I, I think that people are going to appreciate knowing this so much because as we move into that next chapter of life and we're looking at legacy, publishing our books, telling our stories, what we've learned. What a great gift to leave. So those of you who are thinking that Aurora is your go-to spot. So we'll have her information in the show notes. But before we, we talk about show notes in the end of the conversation, what is it that the top 4% do differently to communicate? It's one of the things you talk about Aurora. And I think all of us want to do better. How do we do better? I think there's two things that the top 4% do differently from most people. And just by the way, how I got the top 4%, most people are familiar with the Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule, but you can do the math twice. I know my MBA is showing. So if you take the top 20%, if you take the top 20% of the top 20%, that's 4%. So in that 4% are going to be the Steve Jobs of the world. Those are going to be the people that we are... Uh, uh, compelled to listen to because they're charismatic or they're joyful or they've got something going on like an Oprah, for example. So what these people do differently is two things. One, they prioritize communication skills. 
They prioritize proactively learning and mastering communication skills. We, are, we all can talk, but that doesn't mean that you know everything there is to know about communication. So Steve Jobs practiced for three weeks before Apple launches. He's a busy man, but he devoted three weeks to where he was going to stand on the stage, how, you know, which slide he was going to click to, how he was going to do the intonation. Why would he put three weeks of effort into it unless it was worth it? But it was worth it, right? Because he knew that so much depended on that short period of time. But for all of us, there are those moments that can make a difference where 20 minutes can change the trajectory of your life. I mean, the first time that I was uh, pitching something and it was televised, it changed the course of my life. That 20 minutes changed the course of my life. But I had practice and I had, you know, worked on what I was going to say. And as a result of that pitch, you know, I, I became a little bit famous in the film and television industry. I uh, started launched a bidding war that my agent was fielding offers on my behalf for the screenplay that I was pitching. It eventually ended up that I had a, you know, a couple of really great jobs in the business. And I went to the Cannes uh, television festival and had this glamorous life, but all could be traced back to that one 20 minute opportunity. But good luck is when opportunity meets preparedness. So the top 4% prepare to communicate well, they understand that it's not just about winging it, that they need to practice and perfect it. The second thing they do differently is the first thing that you learn about communication. No, maybe not the first thing, but the first thing that I would teach you is how the brain actually works, the neuroscience of communication. So most smart people, especially Silicon Valley engineer type people, they make the mistake of thinking, oh, Lois is a smart person. I'm a smart person. I'll just send her the verbal equivalent of an Excel spreadsheet. She'll open that and, you know, message sent will be message received. But that's not how it works, not at all. So I'd like uh, people to remember just these three steps. And let me just give you a metaphor so that you'll remember it. Is the is imagine a castle with a moat and a crocodile in it. So our ancient reptilian brain is the croc brain. That's easy to remember. So you've got a message for the king and queen. You trot up on your on your horse. You've got your message, but you can't shout it to the king and queen. They're way off in the castle. You first have to get the moat down. And how do you do that? You have to attract the crocodile. Not too much so he eats you, but the crocodile is not going to be able to process the details of your uh, intelligent message. It just wants to know, is this something good? Is it dangerous? Is it glittery? Is it something to mate with? And so you pass that first sniff test. You just have like maybe 10 seconds to catch the attention. And that's the attention grabbing thing, but not too scary because you can grab attention and they run away. So croc brain first. So chunk out your initial communication. So that would be, for example, that would be the, the title of this podcast, right? Or it would be the title of a book, something short and snappy, like turn words into wealth. That's short and snappy. Um, build your legacy, build my legacy, short and snappy. That's what this is about. That's crock brain. Okay. So you get the bridge to go down. You trot in on your horse. You got your, you know, very sophisticated message. You still can't shout it to the king and queen. They're in the castle. So what's happened inside? Now you're in the, in the middle of the castle and the nobles are there or the commoners are there greeting you. So that's the mid brain. The mid brain is more advanced than the crock brain. And it's the social brain. It's looking for status. It's looking about who is this person and who sent them. It's a who answer. Like, is this a person in my tribe or out of my tribe? Is this person higher status than me or lower status than me? So that would be, for example, mentioning, oh, no, no, Dr. Wayne Dyer endorsed my book. Okay. High status, right? Or my book has won three book awards. Okay. That's the status. So that's a midbrain communication. So Give your midbrain communication, and then the nobles will take you to see the king and the queen. Then you can give your more sophisticated advanced message to the cerebral cortex, which we're calling the king and the queen. Um, and this is an over oversimplification, but you want to mix up storytelling with statistics. So male versus female. So Blend your stories and your statistics. It's a little more complicated than that, but to oversimplify so that you are appealing to both sides of the brain. And then you give a short message to the king and queen. And then if that goes well, they'll ask you another question and then you have permission to give longer message. So the top 4% study communication proactively. They understand that it's a skill and that like lifting weights at the gym, they need to practice 
And they also understand or seek to understand exactly how does this communication thing work <laughs> and understand the basic of the neuroscience of it. You know, none of which is usually taught in university. They teach you how to write essays. They don't teach you how to chunk it down to how the brain actually works. Does that make sense, Lois? Oh, it makes incredible sense. And I think people are going to just really love, love this piece. You've made it so clear with your example. I'll never look at a crocodile in the same way ever again. So I'll be waiting for him to, for me to pass that sniff test. So I'm getting across that moat. So thank you. Very for good. That. It was great. Also, you talk about using storytelling to 27x your oh. your result your the value of what you're doing talk about that 27 this times is unbelievable amazing well i'm always looking for data to back up what my intuitive hunches are uh, so there's a book called significant objects they actually uh, have i think two or three books and other significant objects or whatever so they did an experiment and they took 100 different objects distinct objects and they put them on eBay with a story or without a story. And it was a very good test because the stories were written by all different people. Some of the stories were even sad or scary. They weren't like hyping stories. They were adding meaning. Like for example, there would be a pot mitt uh, for sale and the person would write, you know, my grandmother owned this pot mitt and I have such fond memories of her making uh, chocolate chip cookies and she'd always put pecans in them for me and, and uh, just remember how she'd always make me cookies when I went to visit. A story like that, it just added meaning. Doesn't mean that when you use the pot mitt, you're going to get chocolate chip cookies. But so they did that and they even said, you know, they were transparent. They said, you know, this is an experiment, da, 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 da. so they were, uh, they were totally squeaky clean about it. So the result was that they had these hundred distinct objects for sale without the story, and then the hundred objects with a story. And the result was the sale was 27 times more value or 2,700%. So adding these different stories increased the value overall with these hundred different objects, 27 fold. So that means if you are neglecting to tell your story, you're potentially leaving a whole bucket of money on the table. This is something I also uh, really want to emphasize. Wow. You actually do add real value with your story. Oh, in the MBA, we did this uh, experiment or we read about this experiment with wine and, so, and it was a blind taste test. And some people were told this was a $50 bottle of wine and here's the, uh, here's the orchard and here's the story about it. And then they were told this is a five bottle, you know, bottle of wine. And the experience people had sipping the wine that they thought was $50 that had this story about the orchard, et cetera was a richer experience. It fired off different neurons and more activity in the pleasure centers in the brain than when they thought it was the $5, you know, plain Jane wine, but it was the same wine. <laughs> they just changed the story. So adding story doesn't mean to add hype. It doesn't mean to add manipulation. It means to add a layer and a depth of meaning. Like you told me some stories about gratitude and I got chills because you added a layer of meaning. Just talking about gratitude is so abstract. But then when you added the story, I got chills all over. My hair stood up on end and I'm like, well, that's powerful. Right. So don't neglect the story is, is the bottom line. And just caveat, I'm not saying that every story is going to increase the value by 27 times. If you've got your house for sale for $5 million, it's probably not going to sell for 27 times that with a good story. But if you neglect the story, you are you are still leaving money on the table. OK, so Aurora, our time is almost up. Sadly, it's almost up. What have we left out that the audience needs to know about? Oh, my gosh. Well, I just encourage everybody to tell their story. Uh, they can get free resources at my website, which is Thought Leader Launch, Thought Leader Launch, or they can go to uh, just Google my name, 
auroraWinter.com and they can find those free resources. Uh, I put a lot of effort into writing my recent book, which just came out this, this past week in May, because uh, it might not be May when you air this. It's called Turn Words into Wealth Blueprint for Your Business brand and book. I would love you to grab a copy. People put, you know, years of effort into a book and for such a small amount, you can read all about it and it will walk you through what to do. If you would like a one-on-one -on -one session with me or somebody on my team to find out more about getting VIP help with your book, you can find out all about that at aurorawinter.com or thoughtleaderlaunch.com. And it's my pleasure to be of service. And Lois, you are a delight. I love that you are making people think about their legacy. I mean, books are like seeds. They can travel for thousands of miles and hundreds of years and still be viable when, they, uh, when a person opens it so much later. You know, I interviewed my mother before she passed recently, and I was so glad that I had those recordings and that I can turn that into a book. I shared the audios with my family. So you take for granted the things that you know, you take for granted your experience and your expertise, but you know, memento mori, we all only have so many breaths. So, you know, listen to this podcast with Lois and, and think about your legacy because it matters. It matters. And thank you, Aurora. Those of you who are listening, we will have information about Aurora and how you can contact her. So her, her email, her phone, some of those, that information will be available to you. Should you have trouble getting a hold of her, just let us know. We'll get you in contact with Aurora. She will be a gift that is, you'll, you'll feel like it keeps on giving. So be sure to check out the possibility of writing a book with her. Thank you so much, Aurora, for being with us today. And for those of you who are with us on Building My Legacy podcast, thank you for being with us. And remember to visit our website at Build Tomorrow with the number two and our social media sites as well. Thanks so much. Thanks, Aurora. Thanks, Lois. Thank you for watching my video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell button above. Leave comments. We'd love to hear what you think. And visit our other social media links as well. Thanks much.